And that's why things like this are considered controversial. What we really are saying is we're face to face with something that is telling us we must change. And that creates discomfort in us because ultimately we don't want to change. We want to stay where we are. We want to stay in our comfort zone. So that's what this issue is ultimately all about. Evolution always must take us out of our comfort zone and into unknown territories. So it is always controversial when proposing behavioral changes to people who have simply done these things in an unconscious state of mind their entire lives and been taught that it is okay and there, that there are justifications for these practices. We defined carnism last week as a dogmatic religion, moving on to slide number nine now, as a dogmatic religion based entirely upon violence, based entirely upon violence, the main belief system of which is, is that it is morally justifiable and or necessary to kill animals and eat their dead flesh. I called carnism last week in no uncertain terms the ultimate expression of domination. The ultimate expression of domination. We blew apart, as I said, the normal, natural, necessary argument last week. This argument, I've said, is provably false. Immoral meat industry propaganda. It is not normal, it is not natural, and it is not necessary. And we looked at those provably false arguments last week. We talked about the numbers of lives extinguished needlessly in the animal population just last year alone. 10 billion land animals in 2011 alone slaughtered for their flesh. If aquatic animals, water based animals are taken into consideration. That number in the United States alone, in the last year alone, totaled over 65 billion, with a B, lives extinguished. Worldwide figures were over double that number and places the total number of animal deaths at the hands of human beings in the year 2011 alone at over, well over 150 billion animals. That is 21 times the population, the human population of this planet. This week we're going to start in with looking at justifications for the continuation of this practice and we're going to at look at them one by one. And really there's, there's many more justifications than just the number I'm going to list here, but I want to focus on six major justifications for the continuation of the immoral practice of carnism. It is a religion, as I've said. It's not just an ideology and a practice. It's a religious belief system. It is based on things that are not grounded or rooted in fundamental principles of truth. Therefore, it is a religion. A religion is defined by the root word religare in Latin, which means to tie back, to hold back, or to thwart from forward progress. That is what the word religo religare means, to thwart from forward progress by tying or binding. Religion is binding. We've talked about this before on the show. Religion can also have an alternative meaning of reuniting or reconnecting to something, and that something being truth, being the universal spiritual laws of creation, the universal laws of consciousness, if you will. And that's what we need to retie ourselves to, reconnect ourselves to, reunite ourselves with. That is true religion. But in the sense of religion being used in this world, organized religion and false ideological belief systems, religion is a binding practice that holds us back, that thwarts us from forward evolutionary progress in consciousness. So that is the sense I'm using the word religion in, the connotation I'm using it in. And we talked about what justifications are. Justifications are we could also look at the root word of justification. 
It comes from the Latin jus, meaning right or law, and the Latin verb uh, facio facere, which means to make or to create. So when we put these together, justification, it means to create a right, to make up a right that does not exist, to make a right out of a wrong, to imagine to oneself and to try to tell oneself that a wrong is a right. That's what justification or justifying something is doing. It is trying to make a right out of something that is wrong, morally wrong. And justifications really hold no weight. They hold no water. They are something that, they're, they're lies that we tell to ourselves. That's really what a justification is. Justifications are lies that we tell to ourselves about what we may be doing, what we are allowed to do, that actually causes harm to other living beings. There's no such thing. If it causes harm to other living beings, you shouldn't be engaging in that practice. So justifications means the creation of rights that do not exist. And I put the slide number 13 uh, with alien beings, a uh, seemingly comical slide, uh, until you really think about it and you understand this is exactly what humanity is. Uh, for anybody who's truly aware, you realize humanity is food by our own choice, by our own ignorance, through our own ignorance, we are food. I mean, you want to really know what the purpose of the prison planet is? It's to make you food. That's what the purpose of it is. In no, in, in very simple, easy to understand language, if you want to really know what the end goal is, it's you being eaten. And you can look at that in physical terms, if you really want to look at it that way, I have no problem with you even looking at it that way. But you're being spiritually devoured. The essence of you is being devoured by the dark forces that currently are in control of this planet. And you're being used as a fuel source for them. You're being eaten by them, by those forces, by those entities, if you will. So this is a an ostensibly... Uh, comical piece of um, social commentary here in slide number 13. But if you want my opinion, it's literally true. It's quite literally the case. And these aliens have a human being on their dinner table with an apple stuffed in his mouth and all trimmings around him like a Thanksgiving dinner, like a turkey on a table during a Thanksgiving dinner. And they're all making individual justifications the um, six aliens who are seated around the dinner table, around the, hum the dead human being, are all making justifications for why they feel that it's okay for them to continue the practice of slaughtering human beings and using them as their food. So we'll cover these one by one, and I'll talk about what these arguments really are. These justifications for carnism, which I list on slide number 15. Slide number 14 is simply the etymological definition of justification. So um, slide 15 shows these justifications for the practice of carnism. And the first is what I call the apathy and ignorance justification. The we don't really care about them. They're them, we're us, we don't care about what happens to them. We can't care about what happens to them. We have too many other concerns, don't you know? You know, after all, they have nothing to do with us. They're different and separate from us. What happens to them is their own lot in life. We got to worry about what happens to us. The apathy, I don't care about their suffering and ignorance. If I don't pay attention to it or look at it, it doesn't really affect me. The ignorance justification, I should call it, and start using that inflection when using that word ignorance, because that's what it really is, is it, it's ignoring the injustice, it's ignoring the suffering. The quote that backs this justification up is, we have our own problems, we don't have time to worry about whether they suffer or not. So that's the apathy and ignorance justification. And if you want to remain apathetic and ignorant, you know what invariably ends up happening, enslavement. You can't have 
freedom without care and intelligence. And if you want to ignore things, you don't want to pay attention, you don't want to acknowledge and admit to what's really going on, you're going to end up enslaved. If you don't care, you're going to end up enslaved. If you want to remain apathetic, you're going to end up enslaved. That's how the laws of nature actually do work. The second argument, oh, they kill other animals for food. Why shouldn't we do the same? Well, we see this happening in quote unquote nature. You know, we see animals being carnivores and killing other animals for their food. Why shouldn't we do the same? Why shouldn't we just act as other beasts of the field? It seems like that's the natural order, right? Well, I call this the fundamentally flawed idea of the quote unquote natural order justification. This is this involves an erroneous perception of what nature's laws actually are. And it's based on Darwinian evolutionary theory. Darwinian macrobiological evolutionary theory, which there is no scientific evidence to support. And people will horrifically react to that statement. But go look in the actual fossil record and look at all of the mental gymnastics that is done to to prop up this theory of macrobiological Darwinian evolution. Darwin himself didn't believe in this theory with the religious fervor that people of the modern world accepted. He said that there would have to be ample, provable scientific evidence within the fossil record over many species of transition, transitional species. And you want to know how many of those actually have been found in the fossil record? Exactly a big goose egg. Zero. So for the people that just take a look at a a practice that an animal happens to be engaging in right now during its evolutionary development, we say that's the way it forever has been, is now, and forever shall be for all time. And actually believe Darwin's theory, this idea of survival of the fittest and survival of the, the most ruthless just because we see certain animals engaging in those carnivorous practices today in the modern world, which I've made statements in the past that I do not even necessarily believe that it has always been that way, that animals always were carnivorous in the way that they are today, just because we see them engaged in certain behaviors and practices today. And certainly there is no reason we need to follow an example like that, because we are a higher thought capable being than the animals we're referring to. Just because they're doing it doesn't mean you should follow suit and go and behave like an animal. You're supposedly something a little bit more in consciousness, in evolutionary terms in consciousness, than a base animal. At least we're supposed to be. This idea that man is nothing more than an animal is one of the root ideologies of Satanism. One of the root ideologies of Satanism is man is absolutely indistinct from other animals, completely. And therefore, go ahead and just engage in animal behavior. And if you don't believe me, go look that up. I should know I was a priest in this religion in my past, so I should know all about it. Better than most people, right? Don't even take my word for it. Go read about it for yourself. Those podcasts were all posted in the 70s in What on Earth is Happening, former podcasts. Go go back in, in the early 70s, I believe. Listen to the shows I did on Satanism and Dark Luciferianism. Read those resources. Understand that their mental uh, worldview and ideologies. And that's one of them, that the natural order is kill or be killed Slaughter who you have to slaughter to get your way and do, you know, ensure your way of life. I call this the fundamentally flawed idea of the natural order, which has nothing to do with the actual natural order in nature. Zero to do with it. It's based on a completely erroneous assumption, based on very bl- brief, thin slicing instances of time. And you're making a a judgment on what the totality of natural order actually is. And it has nothing whatever to do with that erroneous perception. 
And we're going to be talking about that a little bit later on the show. The third justification, God gave us dominion over the animals. I love this one. Uh, can't you tell how much I love this one, folks? This is my favorite of them all. God gave us dominion over all the animals. So that means we can murder them and just use them as we please. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's, that's God's commandment to us, right? He said, you can go and murder as viciously, violently, and abundantly as you want, as long as you're doing it to animals, not other human beings. Just go and do it to them, because they're completely separate from my, my creation. You, you're my favored ones, but them, I don't really care about what you do to them. So just go right ahead. And Christians actually believe this bunk. They actually interpret the Bible in a way that allows for their immoral justifications and their diseased psyches to say, I'm just going to continue this because I interpret that God claimed that this was okay. And they're not even reading their own book. They don't even understand their own book. They don't even understand. They understand the words of the Christ in their own Bible. Zero, less than zero. They have what I call negative knowledge of it. Not only do they have no idea what the actual teachings of the, uh, the, the Christ consciousness is all about, but they actually have ascribed things to it which have nothing whatsoever to do with it. And to get back to a zero point, to a clean slate, would involve themselves digging themselves out of a hole for a long time. I call that the state of negative knowledge. Not only don't you know anything, you've... you've put a whole lot of erroneous beliefs on top of the zero point. You know, so you have to dig your way back to zero. Just read the book of Genesis, first of all. If you want to even acknowledge this whole notion of, um, you know, the Bible says, you know, to engage in this kind of practice or not engage in this kind of practice, I think that's a horrible way of judging what's right and wrong, first of all, is that men wrote it in a book and claimed that it was the inspired word of God, and therefore I'm going to just follow that blindly? You need to know, you need to develop true conscience, which is the definitive knowledge of the objective difference between right and wrong. Not have a belief system about what you think is right or think is wrong. And then back it up with man-written words that you're claiming is the divine and inspired word of God. Let me tell you something. The Bible is written by flawed men for the reason of reasons of their own agenda. And yes, they're putting some truths in there. Absolutely. Because to have a poison pill be taken by anyone, you need to wrap it in a whole lot of good stuff. Otherwise, you'll smell the poison, you'll taste the poison, and you won't want to take it into yourself. That's how that technique of obfuscation works. That's how that technique of worldview poisoning works. To get the poison in, you have to wrap it up in something that is very good. And I'm not saying that that's always the case. But with the biblical writings and the specific choice of the canon of the Bible and deliberately obfuscating and eliminating and keeping out of the official canon other books that could be said to be as equally, quote, unquote, divinely inspired. This done during Constantine's reign, the Council of Nicaea, do the historical research. You know, they're leaving out a whole lot of other things that say things that are in direct opposition and, and uh, contrast to what's being said in other books of the Bible. So the Bible's self-contradictory, number one, and I'm not saying there aren't good truths to be found in it. I've talked about them many times on this show. But, you know, let's just give a quote from Genesis that supports the idea that God gave, did, ne did no such thing as his claim to give us dominion over the animal kingdom and say we could just use them as our food as we see fit. In Genesis chapter 1, verses 29 and 30, and this is before the fall, you know, in consciousness, before this horrific event took place that plunged man into the, into the mindset of the animal kingdom, really, that led to a diminution in his consciousness and awareness. The words of God are attributed to this following quote, quote, I give you every seed-bearing plant on the face of the whole earth and every tree that has fruit with seed in it. 
Let me just read that again. I give you every seed bearing plant on the face of the whole earth and every tree that has fruit with seed in it. They will be yours for food. So far, no mention of animals being given to people for food. And to all, to all the beasts of the earth, to all the beasts of the earth and birds of the air and all the creatures that move on the ground, in other words, everything that has the breath of life in it, I give every green plant for food. I'll read that again. To all the beasts of the earth and birds of the air and creatures that move on the ground, everything that has the breath of life in it, I give every green plant for food. No mention of other animals, even to the other animals. No mention of humans eating other animals or even animals eating other animals for that matter. Zero mention of those practices. So I would ask the quote-unquote religious people, they're really nothing of the kind. They're the false religious people. That's why I call this the false religion justification, who don't consider suffering as the main guiding point to bring you to the truth of what actions you should or should not take. If it's generating suffering, you shouldn't be doing it. And I have no problem with the terms you should or you should not. That's part of the new age bunk agenda to tell you you should never point a finger at anyone else and say you're engaging in something that you should not be. Because why? Oh, that wounds their little precious ego. So you don't want to say anything about it ever? Nonsense. That's another false religion called the new age movement. Never ever talk about the negative or, or, you know, uh, threaten someone else's belief system. Oh, because the ego reacts, right? Well, you know what? Maybe that's the whole problem. Maybe people aren't speaking enough about the truth and about what's right. And then other people just think, oh, I'm, there's hardly any uh, reaction to this. There's hardly any uh, blowback to this. So, so I'm just going to continue this practice unabated. No, no one's really calling me out on it. That's the problem, folks. We don't call each other out on our bullshit. That's the problem. This new age notion of just, just letting people do all the harm that they want, never say anything to them, never bring up the negative, never call somebody on the things they should not be doing is nonsense. Nonsense. And anybody teaching that is a false spiritual teacher. So I call this argument the false religion justification because it's coming from these completely erroneous notions of religion and even what their own books have told them. And yeah, you can find contrary things to, to, to the quote I just read you out of Genesis. Fine, you're going to find contradiction in the Bible. Want to know why? It's a man-written book, again, to justify human agendas. And they put a lot of spiritual truths in it so that people would accept it, but also in doing so accept the other stuff that they were throwing in the mix. And if you don't understand that that's what the Bible is, you're very, very naive. Very naive. Or just trapped in that uh, modality of mind control called religion, which we talked about. And you don't even understand the astrotheological underpinnings of world religions. Go back into the earlier shows and pull up the podcasts on astrotheology to look that up, to understand that. So the next argument, the next justification in favor of carnism. Don't worry, this one was killed humanely. Think now, just let's think about that. Just think about these words. Killed humanely. Hmm. Hmm. I can't figure this one out. Let's try it again. Killed humanely. Yeah. These are complete antitheses of each other. They're diametric opposites. Treating someone humanely does not involve killing them. So these are polar opposite words, and yet you're using them back to back in the same sentence, trying to get them to mean the same thing. I call this, it's, it is, it's not what I call it, it's Orwellian doublespeak. 
So this is the 1984 double speak justification. You could put two diametrically op opposing words together and then in your cognitive dissonance attempt to get them to mean the same thing. Killed humanely. Right. Keep believing that, folks. Keep believing that. Because killing is a humane practice. It can be done in a humane way, right? You're taking someone else's life without their consent, but you could do it in a humane way. Keep believing that. Keep lying to yourself, in other words. The next justification is the, I call this the separation worldview justification. The idea that we're all separate and opposite, you know, and, and opposing in nature. And, you know, there are uh, beings that think like us. So, oh, then we should treat them like we are, like we want to be treated. But anything that's not like us, you know, there, this is alien or foreign to us. Well, we should treat that with disregard or that gives us the permission to treat it with disregard. Not necessarily that we should. But if you happen to start treating it with disregard, well, that's OK, because they're not like us. They're not the same as us. This, the phrase here is, they're not conscious or aware like us, so it's okay to kill them for food. And then people will bring the opposite of this argument in as actually, I've heard this brought up as a justification for continuing to eat meat, saying, well, you eat plants. Plants are a form of life. And we're going to directly address this today, this notion of, well, since plants are a form of life, it's equally as wrong to consume them and make them a part of your diet. And people will actually use that justification and say, well, hey, if you're going to eat plants and it's wrong to eat them, why not just go right ahead and eat animals anyway? And there's no real difference. Well, there is a difference. There is a difference. And if you understand the laws of assimilation, if you really understand the natural laws, the true natural order that does exist here, you would understand, yes, we can at this point in our evolutionary development consume plants for our sustenance. I would say at some point when you get, when you move to be as evolved that you would not need plants as part of your diet, that the, the physical vehicle would be so light or so non-physical that you would not need plants, then I would even go and make the statement, now you shouldn't be eating plants. Let them be. If you can live on Breath, live on breath. If you can live on light, live on light. And these things are possible. Not everybody is at that point in evolutionary development. I would say the human physiology is at the point of development where we can live without eating animal flesh, dead animal flesh. And I don't even see really there being any point in time where we could not have, where the practice of carnism was necessary. I don't really see there being any time when that was the case, that it was necessary to do what we're doing to animals, that is completely poisoning the field of consciousness and energy in which we're all living. And then finally, the no justification justification, as I coined it last week, or in other words, the truth, also known as simply the truth. And that is, well, I do feel bad about what I'm doing here, but I could never give up my meat, quote unquote, my meat. You know, it's just way too tasty. It just tastes too good. I'm too addicted to it. I could never develop the willpower to really change who I am and desist in a practice of violence or violence by proxy, which is what carnism is. And those are really the justifications that we use to try to uh, create a right. That's what the word justification means, creating right, making a wrong into a right. Of course, this is an illusion. It can never be done. It will never be done. It's only an illusion that exists in, in a diseased psyche that is trying to make a wrong action okay in their own mind, in their own psyche. So we also looked at the law of correspondence last week when it comes to this practice. And the law of correspondence simply states that that which is above is like to that which is below that which is below is like to that which is above. Or in other words, the universe is self-similar across all scales, across all sizes. And I would suggest modalities of behavior. It is also self-similar. 
meaning if we continue to create chaos, chaos is going to be generated for us by something that is above us in the real, quote, nat the real natural order, okay? The universe is going to intelligently rearrange the field of consciousness around us to provide the experience that we have been generating through our behaviors. And it's going to reflect that experience back to us so that we will learn the lesson that, hey, it's not okay to behave like this. We should not be engaging in such practices. And people look at the image that I presented and they think of it like, oh, well, that's just the natural order. Oh, life eats life. And, you know, a little bit uh, life that's real small gets eaten by something that's bigger and then that gets eaten by something that's even bigger. No, that's not the natural order. This is the Darwinian notion of the natural order that is a religion that is based on dogmatic religious belief systems. This is not the real natural order. This is not what nature does. This is chaos. This is the state of chaos. It's the exact opposite of order. Things, everything eating everything else. That's chaos, ladies and gentlemen. And that's chaos that we have created by not saying no to this condition. This is a condition. It's not the natural order. It's not nature. There's a difference between the human condition and human nature. We've talked about that ad infinitum on past shows. In natural law, when people say, well, animals eat other animals, so why shouldn't humans do it? It seems like it's natural. Human beings, because of the, the complexity and the um, different nature, the higher nature of their consciousness and their ability to think and reason and comprehend and delve into the laws of nature and understand them. So their ability to reason and understand ultimately holds a human being to a higher standard when it comes to moral law than animals are held. Now, that isn't to say that when an animal you know, eats another animal, that's wrong for them. We are held to a higher standard because of our higher consciousness. So natural law is going to have an effect upon us for doing that. There is also another consideration to take into account when it comes to this. And something that um, has been hinted at in ancient writings, that it is very possible that perhaps even in the, the quite ancient past, or maybe even not in the, in the so distant ancient past, but in the near ancient past, that this even was not always the case for animals. People believe in this linear progression that, that species cannot fall from a place that they once were, from a higher place they once were. We have this erroneous notion through archaeology and anthropology and other sciences who uh, haven't really seen the full picture in scope about how cycles of time work, okay? And the, people think we're moving in a linear progression from less advanced to more advanced, and nothing could be further from the truth. We have seen higher places of our civilization, we have seen lower, and time moves in cyclical progressions that are not, we're not bound to those cycles, but they are tendencies, and our choices will ultimately determine what we experience as a result of those tendencies and uh, how we react to those ebbs and flows in time, of those cycles of time. There is, is a high degree of probability and a lot of evidence through uh, some ancient records that animals were not even always at the base level of consciousness that they were at and perhaps did not engage in the types of practices that they engage in in what we call the natural kingdom, you know, uh, at some past moment in time. So animals may not even have always been like this. We're looking at their current condition and just accept, accepting the notion just because we see it like this and it, for as long as we've been paying attention or keeping records in the modern world, believe it has always been like this and therefore that is how it always should be. Again, this directly relates with worldview. What you believe we are 
or are capable of becoming. And I talked about one of the defenses for carnism or justifications for it as the we are argument. And you'll hear people saying this all the time. We are hunter-gatherers. That's what human beings are. No, that's a condition that human beings were experiencing and actually really even aren't experiencing that except in isolated pockets of the world today. We are not anything. We can be what we want to create ourselves into. Uh, uh, other than the makers of right and wrong, we can basically be anything we want. That's not, man cannot ever make that. But man can evolve and not be bound to certain practices or ways of being in the world that he may have once uh, b bound himself into or environmental conditions may have temporarily bound him to, do, uh, to, to engage in. We are not anything. That's the whole thing to keep in mind here. That's the worldview. If you're stuck in the worldview that the current condition is eternal, you might as well hang up your hat now and walk out and give up. And why bother saying a word, talking to anybody, trying to affect any change, except your situation? Because right now you're a prisoner. So could we say human beings are prisoners and that's just eternal and you must accept that and be like that forever? No, it's, it's ridiculous. It's nonsense. You have a choice. Choice is what's keeping us in the prison of our own design, of our own making. We can choose something different if enough of us want it. The same is true when it comes to what we call nature. What, we are call, what most people are calling human nature has nothing whatsoever to do with what the real essence of humanity is. It's the current condition that they are attached to and identified with and think can never be changed. They think that it just always was, is now, always will be, and it has to be accepted. And that is a poisoned worldview attitude and way of looking at the world. So I don't even look at it as animals have always been like this. I think animals were once at a higher level of consciousness and didn't do this to each other. How about that? 